Our concluding speaker uh, is Nancy Lee, former head of CBC Canada TV and Radio Sport, um, <clears throat> and the international president of the Commonwealth Journalists Association, uh, Chris Cobb, uh, who is also in Canada, uh, is chairing the session. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. And um, it's, um, it's what, late morning here. Um, I'm in Ottawa. And Nancy is in uh, Toronto. Um, you know, with the Commonwealth Games around the corner, I have to say that we couldn't ask for a more accomplished guest speaker than Nancy Lee. Um, she, she's got a long time attachment to the Commonwealth Games. She's worked at four of them as a producer and head of CBC Sports, and more recently served on the board of directors for the Canadian Commonwealth Association as a media consultant. I'm Nancy worked for 20 years in, in, in the CBC in news, current affairs and sports as a reporter, producer, and later the head of, of CBC Sports. Um, in that job, she was responsible for the broadcasting rights, negotiations for the games, and all other sports properties on the CBC. Um, uh, which, by the way, is the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, as well as overseeing a staff of 100 <coughs> and production of 1,000 hours of original sports pro programming each year. Nancy has worked at 14 Olympic Games and continues as a production consultant to the Olympic host broadcaster and is currently the Gender Equality Advisor to the International Olympic Committee. That's a, a whole bag full of accomplishment. Um, and welcome, Nancy. And um, I'm going to uh, just hand over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris, for the, for the introduction. Um, I know it's been a long day for everyone. So um, I, hope, uh, I hope the next couple of minutes you'll find informative, if not entertaining. And I, I must say that um, if you see me moving my hands around or swatting my face, there's a mosquito in the room. I'm not trying to keep myself awake, I hope. Um, there's just, as Chris mentioned, just a few weeks to go before the opening ceremonies. So I thought what I would do today is take a little bit of time just to review for you what I would refer to the considerations and challenges uh, media companies have in uh, covering a Commonwealth Games. Um, I'm going to cover three themes. Uh, they're not so much connected uh, to one another, but I'm hoping that each kind of gives you a, a different facet of, of what the media look like. And, and again, as I said before, what their challenges are. The first is to figure out how the games fit in a, in a very, very, very busy um, competition or sports, uh, international sports calendar. The second is to give you a bit of um, a bit of an overview of the challenges that facing media and how media companies in the one that I work for, as Chris said, Canadian Broadcasting, how we make our decisions whether or not to cover the Commonwealth Games. And then finally, more in a personal perspective is, is I think it's really important to report beyond the podium results. So we'll end the, the presentation with that. So one of the major challenges um, facing the Commonwealth Games Federation is how to make sure that they get top-notch athletes at their competition because whether we like it or not audiences and again my focus is most on television um, whether you're streaming or on over the air is they want to watch sport that matters and in order to get sport that matters they're looking for the you know the best the best in the world and the best coming from the commonwealth games so the list on the left uh, are the, the the many competitions that are going on this year and the issues that are facing the athletes so the World Championships of Athletics is coming up. We just finished the swimming last week in Budapest. Ongoing all the time are World Cup and the World Circuits. And I'm talking, when I say amateur sport, I'm talking amateur versus professional, but it's really high performance amateur sport. Um, you do have continental multi-events. And then I've referred to the Olympic hiatus. Often athletes at this level will take a year off after the Olympics to rest. Um, from, you know, hard training and uh, getting ready for the next Olympics. Having had Tokyo last year, another challenge. But I included this photo of um, Ariane Titmus from uh, 
Australia because she's rather, I find, unique. She did not go. She won two golds in, in swimming in 200 and 400 free at, in Tokyo. She didn't go to Budapest last week. She decided she didn't feel like it. And instead, her plan is to uh, come to Birmingham for the Commonwealth Games. So I, I, I wanted to add that she's, she's, she is unique. There are not that many that make that decision to, to not go to the world, but she did. So good on her. In attracting the audiences, again, it's a challenge. And I'm, these are examples I'm giving are very North American and very kind of Canadian or US based. But every weekend in the summer, there's a tennis. Every weekend, there's golf that you can watch on television. You can get six or seven days worth of Major League Baseball. You can get six days of Canadian football. Um, that's the North American football. You've got all those World Cup circuits going on. And then the, the last three are really important for audiences and television and the media. The first is the time zone difference. So where a games happens. For Birmingham, that would be very good for Canada to be able to watch. But when they're in Australia, over in India, there's not that many people that are getting up in the middle of the night to watch sports. So that can be a challenge for the media, the time zones. Um, I put in life because when you go to the, when I or uh, workers or you know, coaches and athletes go to, to a games, Commonwealth or Olympics, that's all we think about. Well, the rest of the world doesn't. Life is going on. And they're not always glued to their monitors, wherever they might be, or their tele television. So that's a challenge. And the last one for sure, as odd as it is, is local weather particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, if the weather's nice, we're outside, we're not necessarily sitting by our television monitors or television sets to watch uh, competition. I thought it was important, instead of me assuming what athletes think about the Commonwealth Games, I checked in with uh, three Canadians who, who um, Linda Cuthbert, on the, the, her quote on the left was a diver, Ellie Black is still a competing gymnast, and the photo on the right is um, Graham Smith. And um, as you can see, each, the, the, two, the two women referred to, this is a really important pathway for them. And as a diver or a gymnast, you may have gone to a World Cup, you may have gone to a World Championship, but this might be their first time in a multi-sport event. So it's getting used to the village. It's getting used to all of those distractions, but staying with on the competition. And I included the picture of Graham Smith, black, I think it actually even was black and white, 1978 before the pe most people in the room were alive. Um, he actually won six gold medals. Uh, it's a record at that one games that has not been broken. And his family overall, there's five swimmers, they won 18 altogether at the Commonwealth Games. But what Graham did that year, he and his coach, 18 months out from the Edmonton Games, they decided not to focus on the Olympics, but to focus on the Commonwealth Games, to focus on winning six events, and his entire training was for that. So I just thought it was an interesting perspective. And um, just to mark the Queen's uh, Platinum Jubilee, I included this picture when she was presenting the medal to him in Edmonton. As I said earlier, the Commonwealth Games Federation knows they have a challenge to differentiate the games. And um, these are some of just some of the initiatives that they have undertaken. Now, the sports program, essentially, that's the sports that you would see at the games. And they, the, the Federation focuses very, very much on putting sports into the program that are of interest to all 72 uh, members, some are nations and some are territories. This is different than the Olympics. The Olympics is um, how their sports program comes about is based on tradition, what has been in Olympics before, what the host uh, city would like, and television. And in the case of the Olympics, because the American broadcasters pay so much money, uh, they have quite a say. But what the Commonwealth has done is really start and focused on you know, for the 72 members, what, what sports matter to you? They do consult with the television folks, but it is quite a different skew to actually start with their member nations. Um, another way they differentiate is the full integration of para sports into the competition, which I think is absolutely terrific. And in Birmingham, it'll be historic. There will be actually eight para sports that will be part of the program. Another first for Birmingham is that um, for the first ever in a multi-sport event, there will be more medals uh, for women than for men. Um, the thing about hosting is, as you probably read and see, it's, it's a lot of money. It's a lot of money for a city, for a country to host a major games, Commonwealth or the Olympics. And I think this is a differentiator because the games, there are fewer sports at a Commonwealth games, they're more manageable. So therefore that there are, there's a, an opportunity there for more countries 
of smaller sizes or smaller capacity to be able to host a games. And that just brings, a lot, I would suggest, an awful lot of benefit to the city. An awful lot of headaches, but an awful lot of benefits as well. And then lastly, uh, the, the, there's games host initiatives. I, I, I was able to tune into the latter part of the sports panel and Jeff mentioned how they hire uh, students for their internship program to hire for their production. But the Commonwealth Games Federation makes makes a point of trying to encourage the host cities to create initiatives that are community based or region based, and also that help the Commonwealth. And I've met the one I put up here is um, dear to my heart. It's a, it was a female coaching program that ran in Gold Coast in 2018, and um, very few coaches at the high performance level are women. It's around 10% of, of, of coaches that would be at a Commonwealth Games or at the Olympics. So to, to change that, the Federation ran this program where they had an application process. 20 women from around the world went and worked at the Games with their country and also attended courses at the same time. And it's a classic in terms of women and trying to get them through the barriers is once the high performance coaches of their country saw that they could do it, because of course they could, they have since gone on and been assigned to international events after that. So again, another way that the, the CGF and the Commonwealth Games has, has differentiated itself that you wouldn't actually see because we're so focused again on the podium. So the second theme um, is uh, focusing on the media and the considerations, as I said before, about whether or not the media and a media company will cover or not cover the Commonwealth Games. And, and for the purposes of today, I'll just focus on television. Now, Jeff might have mentioned earlier about the, um, the host broadcaster, but just in case he didn't, um, a games of this magnitude, there's only one production firm that actually comes and does the production and gives the, the coverage to all of the rights holders, most of whom have paid a, a rights fee for this. Um, Sunset and Vine Productions, they did Glasgow, and again, his company is doing it again for Birmingham, and they've been preparing for years for this. The, the second line is a list of some, most of the, the, the major broadcasters that are covering Birmingham. And I do, I, I do want to kind of give a shout out to the BBC and the Australians because they are per, always, always um, there to cover the games. The BBC for sure, no matter where they are located around the world. And the Australian networks um, have always competed. They, they always want to be at the Commonwealth Games and both countries um, benefit from the coverage that they give. The others that are listed here are, just for the acronyms, is ABU is the Asian Broadcasting Union, CBU is the Caribbean Broadcasting Union, and CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Union. There's Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. I haven't worked there for a few years. Um, I did check with Chris Wilson, who's the current head of sports, and this is the coverage that they're doing. I, I refer to it as over the air, that so, sometimes people refer to like uh, the legacy of, of television or linear, but uh, they're doing 10 hours. Um, they'll do six live streaming channels and sending one crew. And you'll see um, a little bit later how that's changed a, lo a little bit. So here I've listed just a few of the examples that I think are challenges that the companies, broadcasting companies face in any way in deciding whether or not they're going to cover the games. Um, sometimes they have to figure out, as Chris has done, Chris Wilson, is are we putting it on the main channel, the network channel, or are we going to stream it? Um, or are we just going to cover it online on CBC on, on the website, or are we just going to cover it on CBC radio? Um, as the first point, um, indicates typically money matters. And uh, an event like the Commonwealth Games, is it's called incremental. So normally you get an annual budget and that would be covering, in the case when I was there, X amount of hours of amateur sport, but it did not include a major event like the Commonwealth Games. So that means you have to go and look for money. And at the Canadian Broadcasting Company, we have, corporation, we have commercials on, on television. So essentially, it would be either going to my bosses and then saying, you know, can I have some incremental from the, your budgets or getting sponsorship and sponsorship for the Commonwealth Games is a challenge in Canada for sure. It was very, very difficult um, sometimes because it again, it had come after a, a winter or a summer Olympics and other times it, it was just a slog because um, to my last point is the sponsors are looking for that level of competition and do these games matter? Um, and as I said earlier, the third point is it, 
the sports calendar, the busy sports calendar matters as does the time zone. Because you think, okay, if it's in India or in Australia, what's it worth to us? Are people going to get up, as I said, in the middle of the night to watch it? Birmingham, as I said, is perfect for that. So all of these things kind of come into the thinking. The the NL up at the top there refers to me because I wanted to make sure that these points were my points. They weren't necessarily the official formal points of, uh, when I was at the CBC, but they, they mattered an awful lot. Um, there are two uh, sports, 24-hour sports networks in Canada that we call the private sector. They have no interest in the Commonwealth Games, no interest really in amateur sport because it doesn't make money unless it's hockey or curling in Canada. That they're interested in, and that, fair enough. But I always felt it was the role of the public broadcaster um, to, to support amateur sport, not that we were always positive about what the results were from an editorial perspective, but at least to be there and to cover their efforts. Um, aligned with that was there's, you know, 300 plus Canadians competing at this international level. And again, it's not like 20, it, it, there's 300. And I always refer to the aunts and uncles who are taxpayers who are interested in seeing their uh, nieces and nephews compete. So again, just it was a, a large contingent of our athletes competing. I also felt that Canada, and there was so much talk there earlier about the meaning of the Commonwealth and, and Canada's place in it, and, and I, I just felt that it was something that it was important. And as we said before with the, the divers and the gymnasts, it, it is an important part of the pathway. I do have a small anecdote about Manchester. Um, when I, I needed to, I, we sent 30 people over to that Games, and I needed an awful lot of money to do that. We had 50, that's five zero hours of, of over-the-air coverage again a lot of money um so i went to the vice president and part of my pitch was well it's in manchester and that's where coronation street is produced now coronation street is a long-running soap opera in in the uk and is very very popular on the cbc and has huge audiences and the other pitch i gave i don't not too sure if he cared about it was it was another mark of a jubilee for the queen but anyway i got the money and um, we, I was really proud of the, com uh, the coverage that we did in Manchester. So I'm going to move on. This is uh, the third and the final, the final theme that I have about reporting on more than, than just the winners. Um, again, this is Ellie Black, um, the gymnast. And as she pointed out to me, because I asked the question, I said, you know, what, what advice would you give to the reporters? Now, this, this is an athlete who makes the podium, who's, who's won gold medals at the Commonwealth Games and medals at the Olympics. And, and I think her point is really important is that all athletes deserve the coverage. All athletes deserve the sport because um, there is so much emphasis in the media on winning and that no one remembers who came forth. Um, they're ignored by the media and they're eventually they're forgotten and they shouldn't be. And um, the reasons, and I got to tell you, I, I, we didn't do it enough. We hardly did it in, in terms of covering these stories as opposed to just the focus on who was on the podium. But I think if you do that kind of coverage, you're definitely going to be differentiating yourselves from other media outlets because not, not, none of us or very few do it. It's also a huge service to the sports community. And you're also being able to show to your audience that there are tens and hundreds and thousands of athletes behind the three that made it to the podium who are training just as hard who at this level of competition, high performance sport are totally focused their entire lives on, on achieving results. They fell short. Um, it's not, it just happens like it happens for all of us in, in our work. And I think that the fact that they get, they don't get enough coverage, um, that, that's not, a, that's not how it should be. Or, and, I, and hopefully you folks will be able to change some of that. So, I thought I would end with giving a note on, on why hosting a major event like the Commonwealth Games brings out the best in a community. And these are three uh, local heroes whose stories are posted on the Birmingham 2020 site, 2022 site rather. Um, Jeevan is a leader in uh, field hockey. Uh, Dave's involved in marathon running. And Yasim has co-founded a women's football league. And um, I've included them because I don't think if the games were not happening, the media coverage of their exploits in sport would, would not probably be reported on at all. And that would be a shame because my point is I'm here thousands of kilometers away from Birmingham. I've learned and seen what they're doing about sport and how they are using sport to reach out and support their community. 
And personally, I just think that's the power of sport and that's the power of hosting a Commonwealth Games. So just finished with this is um, a, a few final photos, um, the mix of the podium uh, athletes. And I've just included two others. On the left, you will see Yassim's uh, uh, soccer, or I shouldn't say soccer, sorry, football pitch um, in terms of that they got for their league. And on the right is Declan Cross as a squash player who clearly has got the attention of two young boys in, in that um, workshop that he's holding. So I'd like to acknowledge it to end. Uh, Lane Harrison and the, the uh, conference committee for um, inviting me to participate and just like to thank everyone uh, who's there today and online. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. That, that, that was great. Um, I'm going to uh, ask anybody who is physically in Birmingham or uh, online if they have any questions. Unfortunately, I... Technically, I'm, I'm probably not going to be able to hear them. So if somebody else can, who's on the ground there in Birmingham, could, um, could, could help me out, that would be great. So are there any questions? Nancy. Hiya, I'm Emer Smith. I'm from Queen's University in Belfast. I was just wondering whether we had a couple of speakers on earlier um, talking about sport and sports coverage. And I was wondering whether um, in... In Canada, perhaps, whether uh, there is like a change in sports coverage in the male-female um, kind of representation of what's getting covered when. Because um, there's a lot of the time historically just a focus on male sport and female sports kind of like it, there, there is changes happening and you can't see them. But is there is it happening quickly or slowly in Canada? Uh, I would say slowly at best, if not at all. <laughs> so I'm sorry to be so negative off the top, but... You're, you're, thank you for the question, and it's um, it's it is very very slow. I think that the good news is is that the, there is a, attention being paid, um, but in our country, it's it's hockey, ice hockey, a hockey all the time, and it's always the men's hockey. Um, even at the Olympics, when the women are the ones that are on the podium, winning the gold or the silver, and the men aren't, they've gone home because they didn't make the final. Um, still the, the media will cover, cover the men more. However, there are ways to do it. And um, part of, of your, I would say your jobs, as well as producers and editors, and the job that I had when I was at CBC is, you, you, have, to, you have to put it on your radar. And there's a couple of things I did. I would put it into contracts, because you negotiate contracts all the time to have the ability, as I said before, to own the rights to go to a Games or to a World Cup. And I would make sure that I put in things that um, if there was pay, there's a there was a beach volleyball World Cup event, the money had to be the same. And the beach volleyball one, I also said that the women don't have to wear the skimpy little bikinis if they don't want to. Um, and I I actually made sure with some people in Canadian volleyball that that would occur if they wanted to. And the other thing that what I would do is I would schedule on the air to make sure that if we were running a women and men's events, that I that gave them absolutely equal, equal participation. And often in those days, and that's still true, the largest audiences in, on a weekend will be Sunday afternoon. Most There's still that concept that people might be home watching. And if I, I would put the men's event on the Saturday and I would put the women's on the Sunday and I would do that with curling or anything that you could do. So um I get, my answer would go back into it's the same with reporting. It's the quality and the quantity of the reporting that you're doing and how you're referring not to the girls because we don't call them the boys. There's a whole sort of series of things that can happen. So I will do another shout out to my colleagues at the BBC. But four or five years ago, and Barbara Slater is the head of production there, they made a conscious effort and they'd still do this programming. I think it's about a week where they absolutely focus and, and put a priority on making sure that the, the women's sport is covered. And they've also hired a full-time sports editor. I don't know sure if the person's male or female, it doesn't really matter, but their job is to make sure that the stories are made available to all the platforms, news, current affairs, and their entertainment group about women's sports. So um, they've made an, they've made an effort, uh, you know, possibly others have. And, um, the work that I'm doing on the Olympics is the same thing. I actually look at the competition schedule, make changes to the competition schedule again, so that at least the women are there. And the last example I'd give it that is in Vancouver, the Winter Games. Um, there were no events on the final Sunday for women. And and um, I, I was the head of host broadcasting then, but I couldn't get it changed. The, the, the local 
rights holder didn't want to change it, Vanok didn't want to change it, but that now that I'm an advisor to the IOC, those that's changed. So that helps a little bit. But I, I hope that the people in the room that you will be do a much better job than than um, my colleagues or I have been able to do so far. Um, I should say to people online that you can post a question in the chat um, in the chat section, which I can actually see. So, um, but anyone, uh, any other questions in the room? Uh, thanks very much. It's really fascinating um, insights. Just in terms of an event's different if you host it. What 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 insights or opportunities are there for hosts, and what can they do that goes beyond the event itself? I I think um, a lot, an awful lot, and and I I would suggest that when a when a city um, I can certainly speak of in Canada, and I would say the same is true what you see in Birmingham is when you're going forward within your country to get financial support from your governments. That is part of it in, in terms of you must do things for the community and for your region above and beyond hosting the uh, international athletes there. So. Um, in terms of like I, of looking on the website for 2022, those local heroes. I, I mean, I, I go back to that slide that I had before. Is that's absolutely fantastic because those stories that, that those three that I highlighted, but there's they're they're equally excellent. The ones the others that are there, that that means something. And and even if the people around Birmingham or the region would look at those stories, you you find out more what people are doing because. I'm, I'm pretty sure those stories have not made it necessarily in, into the mainstream media or have been, been found before. The second thing that I would suggest of hosting is um, you certainly get legacy. These, these costs, you know, hosting a games cost. There's no question about that. But you, you will have facilities, some that have either been renewed or revamped in some fashion. The good news is we're not sort of starting from scratch and building whole new buildings. But that too, I think, is is a legacy to to give back to to, a, um, to the community for hosting it. And I'll just give you one example here in Canada, in our um, centenary, nineteen sixty seven, long long time ago, uh, these games were summer and winter games were created. And what it is is for the up and coming. It's a pathway. You come out of your province and you you make your way to compete at these. But the deal is is that if a community hosts, they actually get a legacy building. So the hockey rinks and the swimming pools and the tracks and the gymnasiums that have been built out of that, that's the legacy of hosting. So I realize it's a difficult and, and a lot of people who may be not that involved in sports are interested saying, why are we doing this? But um, clearly the work that Birmingham 2022 has done. And I might suggest, and I'd have no idea that the conference of being hosted here in Birmingham is because the games are there. So um, the, uh, there's a lot of benefit. Any, any other questions for Nancy? Uh, Chris, I yes. Um, uh, I didn't get a chance to ask this question actually during the previous discussion on sports, but I think you're equally well qualified to talk about this, which is, um, I'd be interested to know how the issue of sport washing is uh, being covered in Canada, you know, with Saudi Arabia, in particular, pouring money into staging Formula One. They now split the world of golf uh, by putting up huge prizes, which half the leading uh, golfers are going for and the other half was, are rejecting. Um, and more broadly, does you know, the, the absolute tidal wave of money coming into sport um, does that mean that these people have political influence? Yeah, you know, the, the, the big sponsors, the, and the, particularly the state sponsors. Nancy, go ahead. Oh, maybe, maybe you'll add to Chris. Um, I think in terms of the specifics that you mentioned, F1 and the World Cup coming up, um, the coverage that the, the media would do around that is when the event is there. Um, so when the World Cup occurs in the fall, uh, those stories will appear in Canada. Um, I, I even I'm going to sit for sure, for sure they're going to appear in print. Um, the, the the sports uh, reporters that we have here in Canada are very news oriented. They're not jingoistic. They um, they will tell the story as they see it, 
in the papers across the country. I do believe, uh, certainly had the, the World Cup been on CBC, that would have been the same, very similar editorial approach that the BBC has. But I, I do also believe that the, on the private networks that those stories will will come out. Um, doesn't mean that they're not going to, you know, air them on that net, on that network. That's that's for sure. I think long long term, um, that the sport at this level, and and again, I'll speak for Canada and television. It's a combination of two sources, two real sources of money. Sometimes the government, and then it's sponsorship. We we're not like the the Americans. Like we're one tenth of the the, the size. Um, the sponsors that are in Canada, their head offices are normally in the United States. So they don't take a lead from them, but um, it will take a sponsor pulling out of one of these events to actually, um, and a lot of them, to upset that financial apple cart. So, um, I mean, every time that a uh, multi-sport event is awarded, whether it's a continental or Commonwealth Pan, Pan American Games for us or an Olympics, um I'm not too sure it comes up in the times of the awarding. It comes up when it's too late after the games have been awarded and the event is on. Not sure if that helps you with the question, but again, um, I don't, we haven't seen the same sort of coverage you probably have in the UK. Just, just be, again, you're, you're football mad. Um, don't have to tell you folks that. And uh, our men's team just made it, in, um, made it in. So um I think it'll come up more in the fall. Yeah, I think the um, the golf split has received a fair amount of publicity here, um, it, and the Qatar story. I mean, why is the World Cup being held in a non-football nation? Um, story is it's kind of dribbled out. It's still dribbling out the number of people who've been killed or died working on the construction. And etc. So there's that kind of, you know, bub bubbling scandal, I suppose. Um, and of course, the Sa the uh, Saudis are investing in the uh, in the English Premier League as well. So, um, yeah, they they um, they're doing a lot of washing. Um, it, it uh, but yeah, and as Nancy says, Canada has qualified for the World Cup, so it, it's certainly going to get. Um, uh, significantly more publicity here than it would have uh, normally got. Um, let's, I hope that helps. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, hello, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Thomas from Queen's University in Belfast. I just wanted to ask um, about public service broadcasting. CBC is a public service broadcaster. Um, it's kind of really clear in many ways to see how in the world of politics and current affairs and even sort of minority languages and local coverage, how public service broadcasting differs from commercial broadcasting. I was just wondering, Nancy, if, I mean, what, what is your vision and what is a vision of how public service broadcasting coverage of sports is different fundamentally or, or less fundamentally than commercial broadcasting? And then actually just off the back of that last question, does a public service broadcaster have an obligation to cover stories like the World Cup in Qatar, Saudi funding of Live Golf in a different way from commercial broadcasters? Should it have an obligation to do that or not? So um, thanks very much. Thank you. I just want to give a shout out to Belfast. My, our father was born in Ballyclare. So thank, thank you for the two questions from Queens. Um, let me st start with the, 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 sec the second part first is um, it, uh, I, I, again, my knowledge of, of, on the public is, is really BBC and us at the CBC. Without a doubt, it'll be covered that way. That's just the editorial approach um, in, out of news. But I can say that while Technically speaking, the sports department when I was there was not under the journalistic policy. We followed it. And so we would not be shying away, even if we paid for the rights, we were the right, official rights holder, we would be telling those stories and have cer certainly done it sort of all the, the more negative stories through the Olympics. So for sure, for sure, and, and again, as you, you would find in the UK is the BBC does that. I would suggest a lot of public broadcasters do it, but they'd be more knowledgeable on that than, than me. Um, I, as I, I had mentioned earlier, is is that when I was the head of sport, um, I felt it was important that we should support. We, we, at the CBC, we support the arts, uh, whether it's music, uh, authors, um, drama, the whole the whole shebang, and all 
and and we have like networks devoted to various types of music and television and radio shows for for literature. And I just thought we should do the same for sport, not professional sport. Uh, when I was the head, we actually reduced the amount of professional sports. So we got rid of horse racing. Um, uh, uh, F1 was one that went. went. We, we ended doing golf. We, we'd done some golf before and essentially uh, reverted those finances that I was able to keep um, to, to the coverage of amateur sports. So we used to do about two hours on a Saturday afternoon. And when I was there, we were doing six hours. And we made this goal that if we have the Olympic rights, that we should not just be showing up at the Olympics to spotlight these athletes. We should be seeing them before. And part of it is, um, and I know this from all of the, the, the sports associations in Canada, they needed the television coverage in order to get sponsorship because their their sponsors would buy time as long as it was on the television. So um, we didn't, we, we covered it um, and our decision of what to cover was based editorially. We did look at results. We picked sports that either there was large participation of, of just general recreational participation in Canada, or we had athletes at that level who were doing well. So if we were gonna invest in alpine skiing, we would look four and six years down the road to the junior levels and find out, okay, if we're going to make a four-year deal with Alpine Canada or with FIS, but there, there's got to be a reason to do it. So I can, I, I can definitely say that that was a, a kind of a priority for me. And I was just able, that's how I ran the finances is that, um, and, I, and I'm going very detailed, but this is how it works. Like we're, we had hockey nine months of the year. And I have a staff that works for us 12 months of the year. So you give them a little bit of holiday, but the two months that they weren't working hockey, they were working on the amateur sport. And to a person, a camera host, reporter, they all uh, treated the amateur sport with the same respect that they did with the professional sport. And so that was just kind of the, 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 the bean counting and the management of it, but it's absolutely important. That's changed, unfortunately, since I left. Um, and, and again, it goes down to how, like how, who makes the decisions you need. You need people in the leadership that are actually going to get behind anything. And then you need, the leadership needs support. And I had that during my time there. The reason I say it's changed is the mandate of the CBC has shifted somewhat. There's far less sport on the network, on television. As, as you saw before, they're doing a lot of streaming, which is terrific, um, but only 10 hours over the air. And we did 50 in Manchester. So, um, and like there's, you know, the Olympics, it's 24 hours a day over the year as well as streaming. So. Um, not the direction I would like to see it, but you know, I'm, I'm not there and I'm, I'm not making the decisions right now. Anyone else uh, have a question? Hi, uh, oh, I'm Hebe Lawson from uh, Queens Belfast again. Um, oh. another question kind of, um, based off the difference that you've you've been saying about uh, Commonwealth and Olympics, do you feel there is a different legacy and a different sports coverage that you'd expect from both? Would you see more coverage of, say, the ones who don't get onto the, um, the podium in Commonwealth, or is that more common with Olympics, that kind of thing? Um, and how do you approach them differently as two different institutions? Sure, let me, um, I don't think they should be treated differently. Um, and, I, and the reason I say that from a from a quality point of view in the sense of, um, and I know the host broadcaster doesn't. So if, if at the Olympics, let's say that they put 30 cameras on diving, there should be 30 cameras on diving at Commonwealth because the divers haven't trained any less. They haven't tried any less. They're still going to, you know, do their best. So that should, I, I don't think that that should be a differentiation in how, uh, media companies and broadcasters and, and host broadcaster treat the athletes. Um, in terms of, of the like overall, the, the reason that there's a difference in the quantity of the coverage, again, it goes back to the sponsorship, that they seem to fall over themselves to spend tens of millions of dollars in Canada, hundreds of millions in the U.S. to do the Olympics, and they're just not there for the Commonwealth Games. Um, so unfortunately, that's that's kind of the the, the financial decision making. Um, with it would be interesting to see with the, with the BBC. I mean, for sure, for sure, they're going to be wall to wall because it's in Birmingham. But when it heads back to Australia, like, are they are they going to put on the same amount of hours? I would again argue with Barbara and the BBC is that they would treat it like I would like to see it treated. It's it's no different. 
And the last point I would make is I can tell you for, for the production crew that we had on and off air, absolute total respect for, for the amateur athletes. And it wasn't, oh, I have to go and cover swimming or whatever. They wanted to. And they wanted to be at the Commonwealth Games just as much as the Olympics are doing ice hockey coverage. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. We're, we're, we're out of time. We've got a couple of minutes to go. Um, uh, I appreciate your contribution today. It's been fascinating. And, and as with the last session, we probably could uh, continue the conversation for a good hour. Um, it, 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 it falls to me then to, to close this entire uh, conference and really the, the man who deserves the most credit is Richard Bowen. Uh, um, hopefully he's out there in the audience somewhere. He's worked so hard uh, on this for so long um, and he brought together a, a great committee of, of, uh, of young journalists and together they've, um, they've just done a, an outstanding job um, and uh, I think I would um, uh, leave it there because um, he uh, he deserves the credit. Um, so thank you, everybody. I you know wish we were there and, and not at the other, on a screen, but um, but uh, that's the way it is. Um, so thanks, and uh, we look forward to the Commonwealth Games. <laughs>